Welcome everybody to the, um, the third webinar sponsored by the Chevalier Institute. This one entitled Care for Our Common Home and it's uh, hopefully a rich and fruitful conversation about how we can all participate in shaping the future of our planet. We, um, we welcome people from all over the world in these COVID times um, and probably very fitting time for us to turn to the wisdom of Laudato Si and um, to delve into some of the new ways that we can live together and work together. This, um, this webinar is being broadcast very close to the anniversary of the death of our founder, Jules Chevalier, on the 21st of October, 1907. And it's a very fitting way, I think, for us to celebrate um, the person who has been so influential in many of our lives. On your behalf, I welcome the panel whose biographies you've seen. And in particular, I welcome the young adults who are participating in the webinar with us. Student representatives from three of our MSc colleges and two young adults from MSc parishes. At the end of the webinar, there'll be a final reflection that's been prepared by our fourth MSc college. And so we welcome you who are participating now from all over Australia and all over the world. And um, we also welcome those of you who will watch later on on YouTube. There will be opportunities for those of you watching if you wish to make a comment or ask a question. And if you wish to do that, then we invite you to write your comment or question in the, in the Q&A function. And if we get time, we will um, we'll ask your question. So the outline, the outline of the day is very simple. We'll begin with a acknowledgement of country and opening prayer. And then we're going to to turn to Jackie Raymond, whose biography you've seen, who will introduce uh, some of the wisdom of Laudato Si to us. Then Chris and Claude will speak, um, followed by uh, Mark McGinnity as Director of Education. Uh, and then we'll turn to the young people and we'll be inviting them to share some of the wisdom and some of the, um, the challenges to us that they have found in Laudato Si. And so we begin, we begin with an acknowledgement of country and this acknowledgement of country is led by Dara Marlin student, Justin Green. Justin is a year eight student, he belongs to the Arundh people from Alice Springs and the East Macdonald Ranges in Central Australia. Thank you, Justin. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land from which wherever country you are joining this webinar from. We acknowledge their living culture and unique role in their life of Australia today. We pay our respects to our Indigenous brothers and sisters for the care of the land. May we walk gently and respectfully upon the land. Finally, we pay our respects to the Elders past, present and emerging who have and still do guide us with their wisdom. Thank you, Justin. And as is our tradition in these webinars, we begin with a prayer and a reflection and for this webinar, we're going to begin with the opening words from the Hebrew scriptures, which when interpreted correctly, give us um, a wonderful metaphorical and poetical uh, reflection on the mystery of the created world and, our, and on our responsibility as human beings who live in the created world. So let's just take a minute before we, we begin our reflection for you to immerse yourself in the beauty of the created world where you are. Perhaps you can see out of a window or you can imagine what's outside. And just take a moment to actually notice the beauty of the world that surrounds you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, all you see and all you don't see. 
Earth was a soup of nothingness, a bottomless emptiness and inky blackness. And God's spirit brooded like a bird above the watery abyss. And God spoke, separate, water beneath heaven gather into one place, land appear, and there it was. God named the land earth, God named the pooled water ocean, and God saw that it was good. God spoke, earth, green up, grow all varieties of seed-bearing plants, every sort of fruit-bearing tree, and there it was. Earth produced green seed-bearing plants, all varieties and fruit-bearing trees of all sorts. And God saw that it was good. It was evening, it was morning, day three. God spoke, earth, generate life, every sort and kind, cattle and reptiles and wild animals of all kinds. And there it was, wild animals of every kind, cattle of all kinds, every sort of reptile and bug. And God saw that it was good. God spoke, let us make human beings in our image make them reflecting our nature so they can be responsible for the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, the cattle, and yes, the earth itself. And every animal that moves on the face of the earth. God created human beings. God created them godlike, reflecting God's nature. God created them male and female and God blessed them. Prosper reproduce, fill the earth, take charge. Be responsible for fish in the sea and birds in the air for every living thing that moves on the face of the earth. God looked over everything that had been made. It was so good, so very good. And it was evening, it was morning, day six. And so we set the scene for the conversation that we're about to engage in. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce Jackie Raymond to you. Jackie will begin our conversation. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Alison. It's a pleasure to be with you. And um, some of you I recognize and some are new faces for me. So I just want to say, hi, my name's Jackie and I'm a past student or an alumni of Our Lady of the Sacred Heart College in East Bentley. So I feel very privileged to be invited by the Chevalier family, uh, part of my family um, to be with you today. My sisters also went to the same school and my mother taught there, so it is very much a family connection for us. Laudato Si is a remarkable document. It was launched five years ago and it's a very prophetic call to us today. In so many ways, we are yet to live it out, to fully implement the teachings found in this remarkable document. Pope Francis has drawn on the best available wisdom and science and presents us to, a, to us as a story and an analysis. He invites us to see what is going on in our world today, to see very clearly that Mother Earth is crying out, that all of creation, our brothers and sisters, our kin are also suffering and that humanity is as well. This is the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. This call is also coming from a very spiritual place in our tradition and chapter two in the encyclical explores that, inviting us to see that God's plan has always been and will always be about us being in relationship with everything, in a loving relationship, a caring and kind relationship one that continues to grow and weave and develop and mature. 
But sadly, at the moment, we're seeing that there is degradation, there are woundedness and losses in the biodiversity and in the human story. We're also being invited to see that we can restore this. We can actually hold this story of creation in our hearts, in our minds and in our lives in a way that is integrated rather than separating out problems and solutions and causing unintended consequences that create more and more problems. Pope Francis introduces a paradigm in this amazing teaching document. He calls it integral ecology. And in integral ecology, it's about bringing together the wisdom, the disciplines into a common understanding for the common good. It's about listening to our Indigenous brothers and sisters. It's about hearing the cry of the earth, the poor, the spirit. And it's about continuing to uncover and understand the sciences and how things work, how God's design is constantly recreating and how we're called to flourish that, to live into that and to support that. Pope Francis finishes the encyclical document by pointing us in the direction of ecological education that's needed for everyone and spirituality, a call for us to live in communion, far more closely connected to one another and to the earth herself, much like our Indigenous brothers and sisters have for thousands of years. This year, as we know, Pope Francis has also instituted a change in our church in response to the global pandemic that we're facing. Humanity has encroached on biodiversity, which has caused a, zo a zoonotic disease to leap across a virus from wild animals into our population. So Pope Francis is inviting us to prepare the future. He's brought together the COVID commission and he said about responding to the issues that were already present before the pandemic that are being in fact worsened and that need a new pathway forward that we need to respond in ways that create healthy relationships flourishing and healing of our world so this year he announced the laudato sea special year anniversary and in the season of creation he celebrated through a catechesis program called healing our world he also invited us all, families, schools, parishes, everybody to embark on seven year action plans so that we can all implement Laudato Si. So as young people, everyone's invited to live this call and to participate with the global community wherever we are caring for our common home. I might leave it there. It's been a pleasure to speak with you and I look forward to hearing what you're going to share with us today and responding to any questions that come up. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jackie. That was wonderful. I'm going to, um, I'm going to turn now to Will and Ashanti and just ask them as um, representatives of Chevalier College. Will and Ashanti, is there something, either a question or a comment that you'd like to make to begin our conversation? Did you, um, did you get my question, Will and Ashanti? Looks like they're frozen, Alison. Okay. We might move on and we'll come back to them. We'll, um, one of the things that we're, we're trying to do with this webinar is to make it conversational so that it's not just a series of inputs, but that um, the panellists have... Oh, they're back. Okay, the panelists can talk to each other, and that those of you who are watching can also talk to the people who are presenting. So, Will and Ashanti are back. Will and, Will and Ashanti, would you like to um, respond very briefly to um, what Jackie has said to us? Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you first to Jackie, a beautiful introduction to it. I think some of her key points that um, Will and I really found. Uh, resided with us were the fact that we've had we've known about this ecological crisis for 
for a while and yet Pope Francis and society is recognizing that we haven't been able to implement it yet. And for Will and I, we feel this reason is because for so long we've felt it's our duty to do something, but we haven't actually felt this love and compassion for Mother Earth and for God that Alice, um, that Jackie talks about. And if we can foster this love, which changes the mindset from a feeling of duty to a feeling of, I want to do this because I want to save humanity and I want this, um, I want creation to survive, then it makes it easier. And it goes on to talk about her relationship, like the interdependency of um, the relationship between God's creation and that we've got to understand that we're not above the rest of creation, we're a part of it. And so we have a common understanding that through our love, we will do what's right. And so, yeah, that's what yeah, I took from it. I just love how Jackie highlighted the need for education. I think Shani and I had a great discussion of discuss how education is not only the stepping stone to a, this greater understanding of it, but um, yeah, education leads to action. Really, if we don't know what the issue is and how to tackle it, how can we tackle it? Thank you. Thank you, Will and Ashanti. And um, it's interesting, isn't it, when you ask you ask somebody, you have um, you have you have created um, a wonderful introduction to our next speaker, who is Father Claude Mosterwick. And um, um, Father Claude, I think, is going to encourage us to wake up and to see the world through different eyes. And the eyes that he's encouraging us to see the world through are the eyes of love. So you've, um, you've created a wonderful introduction. And can, can I invite Father Claude, please, to, to, um, 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 to, to lead us? Thank you. Thank you, Alison, and uh, thank you, Jackie, for your input uh, this evening, and uh, for, to uh, Justin also for the acknowledgement of country. And I want to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation of the place where I am here in Sydney. I also like to acknowledge the Wiradjuri people who are the custodians of the land on which, which I was born. And uh, in doing that, I want to also acknowledge the dispossession and the loss of land the, of the First Peoples. I want to acknowledge also their resilience and also the kindness of the land which cares for us. And uh, land acknowledgement is, is something that's about listening. It's about remembering. It's a remem about rem uh, rejecting invisibility. So it's about acknowledging the voice of creation, which we heard in that beautiful uh, reflection that Alison uh, prepared for us. It's a voice that speaks whether we will listen to it or not. And the question is, are we listening? And uh, when I was listening to uh, Will and Ashanti, I said, they've just given my talk, basically. <laughs> but uh, but it's, I'm really pleased for that. So we got a great introduction, as Alison said. But there has been a cri de coeur, a, a cry from the heart. And we've heard it you know, recently, two years ago, when the First Peoples, the Aboriginal people, gifted us with the statement from the heart, the Uluru Statement, which was rejected by our government but they refused to be invisible any longer. That creed occur is rising up from our earth and from humanity, especially the poor and the vulnerable in our world. That creed occur, that cry from the heart was expressed in the spirituality of the heart of the missionary sacred heart. When Father Chevalier, the founder, spoke out against the mal modern, the malaise, the apathy and the indifference of, of his time. And Pope Francis has referred to this as the globalization of indifference. And he says in, he said uh, in 2013, usually when we're healthy and comfortable, we forget about others. We're unconcerned with their problems, their sufferings and the injustices they endure. And our heart grows cold. And that same cry that we hear from Pope Francis through Laudate C has been repeated in subsequent documents like Carita Amazonia recently, and also very, very, very recently, about two weeks ago in Fratelli Tutti. We heard Jackie's, Jackie's call, but hearing doesn't always mean responding. 
People do respond out of fear for the future, but a deeper response I would suggest is called for one that rises up has already been suggested from a position of appreciation of awe and wonder at the interconnectedness of all things when we look at the world with different eyes and so then develop deep bonds of affection and communion with other creatures. The spirituality of the heart is a call to love compassionately, to be part of what Pope Francis calls a revolution of tenderness. The stunted love, he says, leads to cold indifference. And we've seen that stunted love and that indifference. We've seen that ruthless exploitation driven by greed. We've seen the economic systems that promote gross consumerism and waste based on the false belief or the myth, if you like, that the world's resources are unlimited and based on the on profit that serves the interests of certain powerful groups and deprives the poor and endangered species what they need to survive. And so Pope Francis says a deep, deep sense, a sense of deep communion with the rest of nature cannot be real if our hearts lack tenderness, compassion and concern for our fellow human beings. And this compromises the very meaning of our struggle for the sake of the environment, that everything is connected, that concern for the environment thus needs to be joined to a sincere love for our fellow human beings and an unwavering commitment to the problems of society. The revolution of tenderness is not something soft, but it's a countercultural way. It's a powerful way of resisting the many assaults upon the earth by overcoming our sense of superiority. It's already, we already heard, because we cherish the earth, we value it and we love it. Creatures are not just resources as Pope Francis says, but have value in and of themselves and give glory to God. It's not enough to think of different species merely as potential resources to be exploited while overlooking the fact that they have value in themselves. So we're looking at different eyes. We're looking with different eyes and appreciation. Nature, my friends, is sending us all to our rooms to reflect and to look at ourselves. We have an opportunity re to reimagine a more connected world. Somehow we face uh, what uh, a moral loneliness, a disconnection, because the supply cord to connection, to caring and doing the right thing by each other and the planet has been severed. Care for creation must stand together with care for the poor, as we've already heard. And as members of the Chevalier family, as the spirit, the spirit of our society informs what we do and where we go. In the constitutions, it says in the poor and the little ones, in all the victims of injustice and violence, we will discover the face of Christ. And he asks us to bring his love into their lives. And the challenge comes, will we show compassion towards them by working courageously to guarantee their human rights and to change the hearts of their oppressors. And so as Pope Francis says, our relationship to the material world is about love. It begins there. It's not just about goods and services. It's a matter of being rather than of just being useful. And so as I said, we're being sent to our rooms to reimagine, to evaluate how we are living on this planet. And Pope Francis appeals to us and says to let ours be a time remembered for our new reverence for life, the firm resolve to achieve sustainability and the quickening of our struggle for justice and peace and the joyful celebration of life. And so our compassion needs to be practical and inclusive. And we're going to talk about that today. And so we might ask ourselves who's in our resources long ignored, like the first peoples, need to be heard and embraced at this time? How do we listen to the pain and the hopes, the vision and the despair of those who have not mattered, who have been invisible, who have not been listened to? What we're saying this evening, friends, is that the future is not exclusively in the hands of our leaders, of corporations, but it's in our hands. 
those of us who recognize the other as a you and recognize themselves as part of an us. We all need each other and we're all responsible. And I just want to conclude with a word from Pope Francis again from a TED talk he gave a few years ago. And he says, tenderness means to use our eyes to see the other, our ears to hear the other, to listen to the children, the poor, and those who are afraid of the future, to listen to the silent cry of our common home, of our sick and polluted earth. Tenderness means to use our hands and our heart to comfort the other and to take care of those in need. Thank you again very much for the opportunity to be with you this evening. Thank you, Claude, very much. Um, many of us would know uh, that, that the founder of the Chevalier family, Father, Father Jules Chevalier, dreamed of the creation of a new world. Um, and Claude, I think you have drawn out of Laudato Si some real challenges for us around the creation of that world. I'm going to invite Mia very briefly from, from Downlands, Mia Bennett, she might like to say a word or two in response to Claude. Thank you. Um, so something that Claude said um, that resonated with me. Um, so he said that about that there are very many underlying issues um, contributing to the problem um, that Pope Francis is addressing in Laudato Si. Um, some of these include um, reconciliation with our nation's first peoples, um, poverty and invisibility of the poor and vulnerable. Um, I think that our unawareness of these problems, in, especially in our own communities, um, we are all responsible and this lack of compassion and forgiveness and love really does show. Um, I definitely think that we are the change and we are the people that can and should um, create response to that. And um, we definitely need to listen more. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mia. That's a wonderful summary of, of, um, of what Claude was saying. We're going now to invite uh, another member of the Chevalier family to introduce our conversation with a, a, a um, spirituality of the heart context. And we, we're going to turn now to Father Krish. And Father Krish is going to, um, to offer us some reflections on the beauty of creation in Tasmania and how it's, um, how it's inspired him to care for creation. So thank you, Father Krish. Thank you, Alison. I'll just um, share my screen just to uh, make it also a, a kind of a photo reflection. So hopefully this will work. Um, let me try that again. I think I need to be enabled to screen share. Thanks, Brett. <laughs> Where are you in Tassie? Um, in Mona. How beautiful. Oops. Oh, there we go. Thanks, Krish. We can see now. I mean, let me just... Uh... Well, <laughs> well, good evening, everyone. And uh, a warm shout out to friends near and far, especially our friends from the parish that I'm at, I'm at in Muna, St. Therese, here in Hobart, Tasmania. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Palawa people, the first people of the land where I'm at, a land of immense beauty and rich history. Thank you, Jackie, for your insights on Laudato Si and your challenge for us to live this out with an integral worldview in all spheres of our lives and ministries. And thank you, Claude, for sharing us, showing us how we can respond with a heart spirituality based on a deep communion with nature and with each other and open to that revolution of tenderness that can overcome the indifference in our world today. I think we can see that Laudato Si is not merely a call to do something green, as much as it presents to us a new lens or worldview, a new mindset, a new way of being 
not just doing. It really invites us to take a deeper spiritual journey with the earth and with each other, seeking to listen and connect from the heart. This, of course, is language of heart spirituality, heart meaning the very essence and center of who we are. It calls us to enter our hearts where God is and listen to what moves us, inspires us, disturbs us, delights us, angers us, saddens us. It calls us to unite our emotions and desires with the compassionate heart of Jesus, the source of life and love that holds us and all of creation. I think when we can do that, we can get better at being open to the hearts of those around us, especially those in need, as well as to the heart of creation, of our natural world. We start to see the world as permeated by God's creative love and presence, but we also start to listen to and feel the pain and brokenness of our world. And we are inspired to respond with and from our hearts. So I'd like to tell you three stories to illustrate these movements of the heart for me when I took a road trip to the west coast of Tasmania. It's called the wet and wild west because of the region's abundant rain and wind. It has a rich history of mining and pining. And I found myself experiencing a contrast of stories and environments. On the way, I passed by the Franklin River Nature Reserve. This is a picture of serene beauty, lush rainforest and flowing river. But there is also a story behind this of what might have been had people not taken action to stop the damming of the river in 1978 and protect its wilderness. It was a turbulent time and Tas Tasmania came to be noticed on the international front. And eventually when this wilderness was listed as a World Heritage Area in 1982, the battle for conservation won the day. I love this quote right at the right corner of the sign where it says, when you go out there into nature, that is, you don't get away from it all. It goes on, you come home to what's important. You come home to yourself. I think it's an apt description of that inner spiritual journey the earth and the natural world helps us to undertake, as well as the movement of the heart in response to the song of the earth, of the river, of the trees. Can we hear that song when we are out in the bush? I certainly resonated with it. I was relaxed, happy and grateful I could come to a place like this, to be at home with my God, present in nature, and its rich history. The second story, as we kept driving, we got to another town with a different history. And you already noticed how the landscape has changed dramatically. While there were lots of dense greenery before, now there is only barren land with the topsoil removed, almost like a moonscape. This is the town of Queenstown. As we headed down the hill, its history as a mining town became obvious when we noticed the digging and the clearing of land, the lack of greenery in some parts, and in other parts, some of that is coming back. This was a rich region for mining copper. Owing to a combination of removing trees for use in copper smelters, as well as fumes from the smelter, mainly sulfur dioxide, those released over 40 years, as well as a heavy annual rainfall, the erosion of the shallow topsoil back to the harder rock profile contributed to the stark state of the, of the mountains for many decades. And check this out. This is the place where they play football. It's on gravel. Mining continues in the town. Although there is renewed effort to remove mining waste from the nearby rivers that have been contaminated for years, I can see why tourists will come here to see something that is unlike any other town in Tassie, to catch the moonscape as well as the surrounding wilderness on train. But what a contrast of stories. After being uplifted by the surrounding, by the lush greenery earlier, the barrenness of this land devoid of life disturbed me. Can we hear the cry 
of the earth. It reflects sadly how the desire to make a fortune can often outweigh our care for the earth. But it is also comforting, comforting to know that there is more concerted effort today to make industry like mining and forestry more sustainable. I suppose the question if, is if it is enough. To the third story. As we left Queenstown and we drove to the coast to the town of Strawn, the landscape changed again to lush greenery and rainforest. On a day that rained cats and dogs, we took a cruise along the Gordon River from there and came to a place of beauty and mystery as we saw some of the oldest trees in the world with mist and rain swirling around. There was no sign of civilization for miles and it felt like I was transported back in time to another era. This is another protected area. The pickup of tourism here has allowed many to see what it could look like when we act to preserve these ancient pockets of nature in our world. Sure, trees were fell to make paths like this to walk around, but they also serve to promote ecological awareness and help us to connect with creation. The boats cruise more silently and slowly along here to minimize the impact. This picture is that of an estimated 2000 year old hewn pine that fell on its own, but now has become the substrate for up to 200 species of plants to grow on. Can we see signs of resurrection? This really is a circle of life that happens a lot in creation that we do not always notice. The human pine tells a unique and quite a rich story. It grows very slowly, about one millimeter in girth every year, and they can grow up to 2,500 years old which means that some of them started life before Christ and they do not start to reproduce until 600 or 800 years of age. The timber has very high oil content, which makes it waterproof and protects it from insects. This of course makes it the best boat building timber in the world. And of course it was exploited heavily in the early days, driving a huge industry based on this green gold, as they would call. Thankfully, concern for the future of these ancient giants started early in the last century. If we kept cutting them down, there will be no next generation of trees, since their slow growth precludes the possibility of plantation farms. The felling of green human pines stopped completely in the 70s, after it was agreed that it was neither sustainable or wise to cut down trees that were a thousand years old. Today, 85% of the human pine forests are conserved in national parks, while 15% is managed by Forestry Tasmania for cutting and salvage. Now I tell you these three stories as examples of encounter with nature and creation, examples of struggle with the impact of human action on the environment, examples of listening to the song as well as to the cry of the earth examples of redemption that is not too late. Because the heart spirituality helps us to do what is the most important thing that we can do right now, to listen, to listen to creation, to listen to its history and stories, to listen to the human struggles and stumbles, to listen with open minds and hearts and wills so that we can be moved and transformed in our hearts to act in wisdom freedom and love so that we can move from an ego-centric world that is all about what I want to an echo-centric world which is centered on our creator God and what we as a global family need at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Krish, very much. What a, what a beautiful and profound reminder to the Chevalier family that the heart of Jesus is heard in both the cry and the song. Beautiful phrase you used, the song of the river. That was, that's very lovely. Melanie, I wonder, can we invite you very briefly to, um, to just reflect on, on um, 
on how you how you felt as Krish was um, was drawing us into such beautiful imagery. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I just want to say thank you, Krish. That was an awesome talk. Um, I specifically loved um, the picture of the Franklin River sign that he showed um, and he highlighted the fact, um, the quote, um, when you go out into nature, you don't go out, you get back to it all, you come home to yourself. Um, I think that's really beautiful and it really reminds us that we and our ways as a society are often separated from nature um, and from creation and the rest of creation. And I think because of that, it's hard for us to truly imagine the kind of effects we have uh, when we consume things and when we use things like cars and when we pollute and um, our carbon footprint. I think going out into nature really connects us with God because we as nature ourselves are God's creation. Um, and I think that, I think that um, as well, when he talked about the um, pine tree, um, the fact that it was older than Christ, I thought that was so cool. Um, and when he said that on the pine tree, there was what, something like 200 species of plants that's just incredible and that truly embodies resurrection and it's just interesting how we can see Christ's face in God's creation and I think because of that if we continue to see Christ in creation that maybe it'll make it easier for us to be more mindful of the way that we treat creation and ourselves. Thank you Melanie. Um, and thank you, Jackie and Claude and Chris. And I think those of you who are watching will agree that uh, we've had a wonderful introduction into Laudato Si and a wonderful uh, focusing of it into, um, into spirituality of the heart, the spirituality of the Chevalier family. And how inspiring to, um, to hear these young people reflecting back what you've said in such passionate and wise ways. So we're going to, to move on now um, and we're going to, to hear briefly from two people within the Chevalier family who actually have the capacity to implement change, to hear what's being said and to respond at a governance and at a policy making level. The first person that we were to hear from is Sister Mary Drum. Unfortunately, over the weekend, Sister Mary Drum came down with shingles. And if any of you have had shingles, you'll know it's a very terrible thing to get. Sister Mary, I know you're watching and we send you and your sisters our, our love um, and our prayers and hopes that you are on the mend. Um, Sister Mary is the provincial of the MSC sisters and the MSC sisters along with the old sisters and the, the MSC priests and brothers uh, are the three groups that belong to the Chevalier family and each was founded or co-founded by Jules Chevalier. Sister Mary has sent me a couple of notes and I'm just going to read them briefly. Um, uh, so just to make sure she went to a lot of trouble to begin to prepare for this. So Sister Mary notes the following ways that the sisters are living their commitment to care for creation. Sister Mary says that each household of sisters actively take small steps to cut down on landfill by recycling as much as possible, including grey water, food scraps, printing cartridges and batteries, they purchase so as to limit single-use plastic and wherever possible, they repair or upgrade equipment to avoid unnecessarily throwing things away. The sisters actively try to lower their carbon and fossil fuels by using public transport and carpooling to attend functions. They use electricity mindfully and are working towards investments that are ethical and sustainable. Sister Mary speaks of the sisters cultivating and encouraging, listen to this, this is really, really important, I think. She says they cultivate and exchange a, 
uh, and encourage a relational change between themselves and nature by shifting their focus and perspective from mastery and domination to seeing themselves as guests in the midst of the enormity of nature's gifts and appreciating the beauty and the majesty of nature. This way of being is embedded into the sister's understanding of spirituality of the heart. I have been very privileged to stay in their houses and I have seen for myself the authenticity of the sister's lifestyle. They do live very simply and they do truly walk very gently on the earth. And so Sister Mary, we send you our best wishes um, and thank you for those, those notes that you've sent. The other person that, um, that we want to um, invite to speak tonight is Mark McGinnity. And Mark, as you, you know, is the director of MSC Education. Uh, and so Mark, can I um, invite you to, um, to make some comments on your vision for how we can embed um, this ecological consciousness into, into the education within our family? Thank you, Mark. Good evening, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land from where I speak, the Gadigal and Bidjigal peoples who traditionally occupied the Sydney coast, and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Thanks, Alison, for the opportunity to speak this evening, and it certainly has been great to hear uh, such well-informed people from a Catholic background speaking about this encyclical and about the importance of caring for our environment and, and love for our world. Concern for the environment has been around for a long time. And while many uh, governments are lagging behind making the hard decisions that are necessary to protect our world, it's actually very pleasing to see that there's a groundswell where the rest of society has just moved past them with respect to this. Um, even just today, I received an email from the Australian Institute of Company Directors. Now they represent 40,000 company directors from right across uh, Australia, from biggest companies in Australia, BHP, right through to all the not-for-profits and even for school boards and things like that. And um, they do a uh, surveys about every six months about what they call director sentiment. What are the issues that are worrying, you know, directors at this time? And um, the number one thing um, in this, and this survey was taken just in September, the number one thing, and I'll quote them, they say, Directors can continue, so it's not just been a new thing, directors continue to identify climate change and energy policy as the top issues that the federal government should address uh, in the short and long term. So indeed, and in my experience, and I've sort of been involved a fair bit with a number of different um, establishments, most companies now have policies on environmental impact, climate change, etc. And directors are actually considered negligent if addressing these issues is not part of their strategic plans. And uh, I suppose we all live in hope that politicians will catch up with the rest of society. Over 40 years ago, I had some fantastic teachers and some uh, passionate uh, university lecturers who, who were incredibly um, uh, committed about the environment, as well as the inequities and the injustices in the world that have contributed much to the environmental degradation we see today, of which others have already spoken. Uh, and as in so many things where change is required, Quality education is the thing. I think people, you know, it was mentioned, uh, uh, Ashanti and Will mentioned that too. And so one of the mottos that was around in the 70s, I think the Friends of the Earth and a few groups, you'd probably remember that, Claude, but one of the mottos was think globally, act locally. And so I say to myself, so what can we as a group or what can we do locally? And um, we have four Australian MSC schools, and they're in four different states and territories where each school has their own particular curriculum. I would hope, and I would be fairly certain, that the students in their studies of science, geography, other um, social sciences, other mainstream subjects, they would learn about the importance of caring for our environment. With the advent of Laudate C five years ago, Pope Francis has placed the care for our common home at the centre of all that we do. And it now becomes something that our students as in an MSc school ought to learn about 
and act upon as part of their religious education classes. So as the director of the MSc education, what can I do? Each college, each of the Australian colleges has a comprehensive ethos and identity review every five years. And that looks at how the school is fulfilling its mission as an MSc Catholic school. Now, the process of this review is up for evaluation just in this coming year. And I will be advocating very strongly to the MSc Education Members Council that in future, uh, this review includes how well and how seriously each college takes the education of its students around the content of this encyclical and also how that is being converted into practical, sustainable programs that the colleges as a whole are embracing. So I know and I acknowledge that some schools are already well along this path, right? Others though I know still have a way to go to improve in this area. And I think that, you know, we, um, and certainly from a governance uh, perspective, now have uh, the oversight and, you know, the, the support of, um, you know, the leader of, our, of the Catholic Church in saying, this is really key to what we do. There are so many things at a school level, and I know the students will have thought of many of these things that we're capable of doing. And I'll be interested to see how the colleges, hopefully encouraged and led and prompted by our student leaders and the students themselves, engage in coming up with suitable sustainability initiatives and they make meaningful uh, changes at their local level. So that's very much uh, where I would be starting with what can we do. Thanks, Alice. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm not sure whether you all realise the enormity of what Mark has just said, that, um, that he as director intends to put care for our common home front and centre of one of the most significant guiding documents of, um, of MSc education. And I think that's a, a very, very exciting thing to hear from our, our director. Um, Abigail, just before we move on, would you would you like to make one or two quick comments um, in response to what Mark has just said? Thank you. Um, I think something to take away from that is that change is imperative in our society with or without the government, and that's going to happen due to the new education of the new generation. Um, and through that, I think the smallest things are going to add up to the biggest change. So without the home that our, the, or the care for our common home that we live, um, I suppose it's the question of who are we without it? So I know through different things we do at school, we have recycling for different drink containers and things like that. And we have an environment captain who's passionate in leading the environment group to see those changes within our own society and within our own community. Thank you, Abigail. That was wonderful. I'm actually, you mightn't realise this, but I'm putting them on the spot. They, they haven't prepared these responses. Um, and aren't they wonderful? Aren't they just so inspiring for amazing young people? And it's, it's now time to actually um, shift and to give these young people a voice. And we're going to hear from, um, from three of our colleges and each of the young people that we have briefly heard from so far and will hear more from now have volunteered, I think they volunteered to um, be a part of this webinar. They've been prepared by um, the person with responsibility for mission in their schools and they spent some time um, studying Laudato Si and listening to work from Jackie. And likewise for Melanie in a parish context, the same um, Melanie has offered to be a part of, of um, the webinar and has undertaken significant work in order to be here. Um, in the, the course of that work, a question emerged from each of the groups and, and we're going to invite one by one um, each of our young people to um, explore a particular aspect of Laudato Si that was of interest to them. And we begin with Abigail Wilson from Darham Island College. Um, I believe that Lisa Hutchinson and Sophie Gibson were a part of the preparation team, although they're not on, on the, um, the panel with her. 
Abigail, um, Abigail is mission captain at Darum Island. And Abigail, can I ask you to comment on the added dimension that Laudato Sea has offered to your understanding of environmental issues? Um, so firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people from where I speak, the elders past, present and future. Um, and we'd like to thank you for this opportunity to share our thoughts. So when preparing for, our, for this this afternoon, um, our group found that the discussion was mainly focused around our need to listen to God's creation and what it's telling us and what we need to do in order for a change to happen. So as Pope Francis clearly says in Laudato Sea, we need to hear the cry of the earth by paying attention to the signs and signals that it's giving us. Um, and these are like being expressed through the increased natural disasters that we're seeing, especially those seen recently, like the horrific bushfires of 2019 and 2020, as well as the warming of the oceans amongst many other things. Um, so these events, there's only been getting progressively worse over the recent years. And following on from earlier, I suppose our Current society seems to be more focused on the current needs of themselves with the mentality that the earth is something that's replaceable. It's something that we can exploit for our short-term gratification. When in reality, that's not the case. Um, we really need to focus on becoming a society who are able to work together and therefore establish common goals for the future of our planet and the overall improvements that we'll see from this will be immeasurable. Uh, some of these improvements, the major one is the, the, meter, the bettering of both physical and mental health. So the more we're motivated to look after the earth, I think the more we'll see that it's willing to look after us. So, for example, with our access to nature, like trees, birds, other wildlife, people are more inclined to go outside. They walk, they cycle, they hike. And as seen in the pandemic, I think that's really something that's good for both our physical and mental health. Um, so responding to Pope Francis' call for ecological conversion, we need to have an optimistic outlook about what we can do and not what we can't. From this, it will feed into our positive mental health. Um, and we need to counterbalance the negative talk that's come up about with the consequences of disregarding our environmental issues by producing possible and achievable solutions. We need to live spiritually by changing our individual habits so that each of us is living in a way that is environmentally friendly. So environmental activist, activist Damon Gamow says, if you're going to set off a fire alarm, you need to show people the exits. So with that change in mindset, I think we're looking to evoke a more hopeful attitude towards the future. And caring for the environment, it's everyone's responsibility. It includes looking after and ensuring that those in the developing world are being mentally and physically protected too. Overall, it's those people who are seeing the effects of what the first or the developed world are doing. So it's the small Pacific countries like Kiribati who face the consequences of the rising sea levels and things like that. Um, to, so to combat this injustice, as mentioned by Pope Francis, it's imperative that we listen to those who are speaking for the earth and therefore like critically analyze the sources and the validity of the information so that we can make informed judgments about our environmental actions. So through making these informed judgments, we can be a progressive society who are open to structurally changing the way we live and the ingrained habits we have that come with our structured lifestyles. So for us to be able to change these, we need to be able to put money into solutions that rely, that reduce our reliance on things like fossil fuels that are ultimately ruining our planets. So changing the way that we live and moving out of things like fast fashions that require a lot of carbon and things like that to be produced that don't last very long, like their effects last longer than their products. Um, so with the imminent threat of a global warming, the question arises of finding somewhere to start, but the smallest changes are always the ones that add up to the biggest results. So minimising our carbon and saving energy are things that we can do to easily transition from the degrading mindset that we have. Um, and making sure that we can educate the younger generation and making sure that sometimes maybe younger politicians and things like that are better for the progression of our society and the way that we're living. Um, so as Pope Francis illustrates in Laudato Sea, it's everyone's duty and responsibility to look after our planet. We should be focusing on the common good by working in small communities that are less reliant on the large corporations. Um, 
initiatives such as creating small community gardens and moving off central grids are some of the, the possibilities that the smaller communities can achieve. So in the 21st century, listening to ourselves and our others might seem like something of the past, but in a time of constant change, it's something that's imperative more now than ever. Abigail, that was wonderful. Alison, are you happy for me to jump in I here? Absolutely, am. Great. I just feel so um, so filled up by listening to what you've said. There is so much in there. So I'll give you um, perhaps a a little bit of feedback from what I heard. Um, you're absolutely right that the situation here on our planet is getting worse in terms of not only with the pandemic, the economic consequences that are affecting so many people in terms of jobs and dignity and all of those serious impacts and poverty with food, but the climate story is getting worse. And behind that is another huge tidal wave, which we can see and has been referred to, which is not only biodiversity loss, but biodiversity collapse. So these are very heavy things to deal with. And I appreciate that you are acknowledging that they are getting worse and that it is going now to the point where it's beyond, it's important that we all act and all our little gestures and all those things we do are important. But we do need those common goals, as you said. We do need to come together and work as one family. So we need to start by doing that in our community contexts. And in fact, that is where the depth of change can get really, really um, real and affect so many other parts of the human systems that we participate in. So I want to thank you for what you shared. You're absolutely right that we need uh, a real depth of conviction in our motivation and that that will stem from our spirituality and a hopeful attitude and that we need to constantly talk like that because if we don't change the narrative, as you said, then we get drowned out in terms of those fearful voices that are so strong. Um, and just lastly, I'd say that, you know, as big as those tidal waves are that we're, we're looking at and that we're surfing at times, um, every small gesture, as Pope Francis says in Laudato Si, is an act of love. So tending to the garden, um, becoming more focused on the common good, the choices of fashion items that you buy, your clothing, your food, all those things really do matter. So I encourage you to continue with that beautiful openness in your heart and your fantastic analysis and research and capacity to keep learning. It's just so inspiring, Abigail. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. And can I remind those people who are watching that um, if you'd like to make a comment or ask a question, you can um, just put it into the, the Q&A function. And we've had one comment come in uh, from Anne Benjamin. Anne is a, a member of the MSC Education Council, the, the most significant body driving the vision and the practice of MSC education. And um, Anne Benjamin in particular wants to congratulate all the young people who have spoken already. And um, she makes a comment that I think is at the forefront of all of our thinking that our world is actually in wonderful hands when if you young people are representatives of your generation. So thank you, thank you so far. And let's um, let's move on now. And the, the next person that we're going to hear from in more depth is Mia Bennett from Downlands College in Toowoomba. Mia has just been named as vice captain of the college for 2021. And um, Mia, can I um, can you comment on this? I'll make a statement first, and then I'll ask you a question. So the statement is given that social, economic, and environmental factors are intertwined in any consideration of Pope Francis' call to respond to the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. Mia, can you respond to what understandings do you think we need and what are some of the ways these factors can be best addressed to help us achieve this outcome? So thank you, Mia. Um, well, so all the social, environmental and economic factors are definitely connected um, and it's definitely difficult to separate them, but because um, they're all kind of reliant on each other. Um, 
but I would like to express some of my thoughts on this question. Um, so I believe that caring for the poor and the earth go side by side, like Pope Francis has said. Um, I also feel like there is little awareness of the problems that have uh, that affect the marginalised and they are frequently considered last in economic and political matters. Um, I also believe that the people who live and work in higher socioeconomic brackets um, have the and that have the power to make the change should be exposed to those living in lesser or more difficult situations um, to understand their problems and get more of their perspective. Um, I feel like this would also create a greater sense of urgency um, to respond to the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor, because without um, this acknowledgement of these issues, nothing will change, unfortunately. Um, I also feel that the wealthy could learn things from the poor uh, using the resources that you need rather than you want. Um, living simply and being caretakers rather than consumers, I think is very important. And I definitely think that we can um, take on some of these things that we see in some smaller, um, less developed nations. Um, I also believe that socially a deeper sense of faith um, can inspire compassion and loving awareness for, the, um, for motivation to care for our world. Um, we also need to be active. We can't be passive about these kind of things. And we need to unite to be able to encourage um, the masses to help to respond. Um, responsibly mm -hmm. using our resources through both ethically and environmentally sustainable practices can ensure that we can continue to use these resources for generations to come. Um, this may mean innovation and slower economic growth at first, but in the long run, um, a relatively stable economy for future generations whilst creating new job opportunities for all through this innovation and new ideas. Um, I also think that it is very important to invest in uh, like social enterprise and um, outreach programs that give uh, people who are maybe are disadvantaged in some way, more opportunity to be able to contribute and participate in our society, um, as well as providing potential employment and other rewards um, and that sense of belonging. Um, and if we stop exploiting our resources, we could possibly reverse the impacts of climate change. Um, this would benefit everyone all over the world, uh, particularly the poor and marginalised as they are most affected. Um, being caretakers of our common home would show our love and respect for creation. Yeah. Thank you, Mia. What, um, what a wonderful challenge in that, eh, to um, we who are so privileged. To all of us. There's um, a comment come in, again, particularly addressed to the young people from John Mulrooney, Father John Mulrooney, who, who many of you would know. Um, he says, hear, hear, to the comments of Anne Benjamin. And he says he's heartened by the wonderful hearts and minds of the young people as we hear from them. They're sensational, he says. So you take that on board and keep challenging us. Um, Chris, would you like to make a comment in response to the challenge that Mia has um, has offered to all of us? Well, thank you, Mia. Uh, that was that was a great uh, great piece there. Um, I wish you were our treasurer as we make our way out of uh, COVID nineteen. <laughs> Some really good good um, suggestions there about about being able to slow our economic growth and innovate just for people to catch up and just to look out for the poor and the marginalized. Um, you mentioned more than once about how they have been uh, left on the side and you obviously have a heart for them. It's very, very powerful. Uh, keep doing that. Um, you also mentioned more than once, I think about being caretakers and not consumers. I think that's such an important shift that we need to make. We really, so a lot of us are born into things that we take for granted and we just consume without thinking too much. And 
it's great that uh, as a young person, you're challenging us to reflect on, on how we can do it differently because we have to think about the next generation and the next generation and so forth. And, and I, think, I think that's great. Um, and certainly I think what I, what I enjoy about listening to the young is not just the energy, but your ability to rally together. I think you're less concerned with uh, politics and ideology. You can come together and you can make it happen. And you're right, it is, we need to work as a community. Um, certainly we start with individuals, but I think the groundswell needs to go into communities and eventually into leadership, into institutions and, and so forth. So yeah, I, I, I really enjoy your, your contribution there. Um, there's, there's a lot in there. Um, I, I think I'll, I'll might just leave, leave it as that because I've been just inspired by that. So thank you, thank you for sharing. Thank you, Krish. There's um, a question come in um, from Maggie Galley and she's addressing it to um, any one of the young students and I'm going to pass it to Abigail who hasn't seen this question. Um, Abigail, can you respond briefly um, to this question? Maggie says, Indigenous Australians took care of the earth before colonisation leaving a very small footprint. How do you see First Nations people assisting our whole Australian community to become educated about caring for the earth? Would you like me to read that again, Abigail? I think I've got it. <laughs> well done. It's a really good question, but I think it all comes back to us listening what they have to say, how they worked with the environment, not against it. Our society at the moment is really working against it. So even through that change of working in communion with the environment or even for the environment, more for more than ourselves, while the first Australians, the Indigenous, they looked after the earth so that it looked after them. They worked in harmony with it. So I think through the conversations and relationships we can build with them and their understanding of the of the earth that we live in, I think that will help us move forward in the ecological sense. Thank you, Abigail. That was very good. Um, I put you on the spot there and you rose to the occasion beautifully. Well done. We're going to now hear briefly a pre-recorded segment from Jim Bailey. Jim comes from Monobay College in Victoria and Jim is business manager at Monobay College. And we often hear um, people in positions of responsibility saying that environmental sustainability and responsibility is a good idea, but it costs too much. So we asked Jim to respond briefly to, um, to ways in which at Monobay College, they're building into their budgeting and their strategic planning, a commitment to care for creation. Hello, my name's Jim Bailey, and I have the privilege of being the business manager here at Monobay College in Hamilton, Victoria. Educating the benefits of, of academia and the love of Christ is fundamental to all that we do here at Monovay, and it goes without saying how important that is to our students. But just as essential is educating the importance of our responsibility to our environment. How do we do this? It's quite simple. It's by our actions and our deeds in how we manage and use our resources that are available. Students are learning more and more about our collective responsibility to care for the earth and I believe are more committed to ensuring that this occurs. It is clear to me that the decisions we make today in, by investing in the many sustainable projects, products and processes that are available will undoubtedly impact on their future. Most schools utilise recycle bins, endeavour to capture as much rainwater for irrigation, have solar panels and participate in LED lighting programs whenever possible. All of these things assist with reducing our carbon footprint. And it is incumbent on each and every one of us as custodians of the earth to ensure that we do all that is possible for the health of our environment and for our future generations to love and enjoy. As our college works towards carbon neutrality as part of its strategic intent, in addition to those things that I've just mentioned, 
we have a clear mandate for any new buildings or developments where it's commercially viable to take every opportunity to use the most environmentally friendly, efficient and effective and sustainable products to ensure our carbon footprint is as minimal as possible. Unfortunately, going green can appear to be costly and have a negative impact on your finances due to the uh, capital outlay. However, when the analysis is completed, once you take into account ongoing maintenance, replacement, etc., and the actual cost of, to you, utilise products, we've found that most products will repay this additional outlay of capital within the first four to five years. After that initial period, the money saved on those ongoing costs can be utilised in, in other school-based resources. Most recent example of this for us has been our cricket centre facilities. We utilised a recyclable plastic product called Modwood for the large seating and standing area of the pavilion, the grandstand area. And whilst the cost of this product was just over twice that of a standard treated timber product, there's no painting, repainting or repair. The product comes with a 40 year warranty. And most importantly, it rids the earth of plastic that would have ended up in the landfill. It is worth noting that for this project, we also utilise the most efficient LED lighting that's available on the market, installed a solar panel air extraction system for the heated air, and all the water's captured from the roofs, and it's diverted to our existing dam that irrigates the majority of our school grounds, including the oval itself, uh, via a solar pump system. I fondly recall the homily delivered by Provincial Father Chris McPhee at his first Thanksgiving Day Mass at the college several years ago. Father Chris spoke about walking around our college grounds the day before Mass, and he marvelled at the wonderful environment, thinking to himself, God made this. God did make this. And as I mentioned earlier, it is part of our duty and obligation to our environment as custodians of the earth to ensure the health of our environment for future generations to love and enjoy. I can proudly say that we are striving to achieve this here at Monavay. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. We could have asked um, any one of our business managers from our colleges and um, they would have responded in a similar way. So you can see that it can be done. Um, uh, we can we can um, be wise with our money and make make prudent decisions while still putting environmental responsibility in a very important place. There's been um, as Jim's been speaking, there's a comment come in from Sister Philippa Murphy. Philippa is the provincial of the Ulsh Order, um, the third branch of the, uh, the Chevalier family. And Philippa, like everybody else, is commenting on the calibre of the young people. And she says she's blown away by, by, who, by what you're saying and who you are. And then she made another comment which she said, she thinks that Father Jules Chevalier is up in heaven, clapping his hands in joy at what he's hearing. So um, thank you, Philippa. So we're going to move now to, um, to Chevalier College and we welcome Will Preddy and Ashanti Still, the college captains from Chevalier College for, um, for this year. And Will and Ashanti, can I ask you to comment on this question? Pope Francis calls for a revolution of our hearts and minds. Can you comment on how we can embody this in our response to Laudato Si? Thank you, Will and Ashanti. Thank you, Alison. Um, before we go into the question, uh, we would just like to acknowledge the Gundagara people on which the Chevalier College Barrel is built. Um, we truly believe that it's by looking to these people and listening to them that we can join together and unite towards a greater ecological integrity. And then in response to the question, Alison, we, we've noticed the common trend of everyone changing their mindset. I mean, we've used the words different eyes, lenses, mindsets, hearts. And I think the biggest thing to recognize is that we need to change. And the first step is by recognizing it. And I think what you've, in your opening prayer, you mentioned that we humans are made in the image and we reflect nature. And right now we're reflecting a nature that's crying out, that is telling us 
that it needs help and it needs us to take care of it. And I think, but the first step is changing the mindset and having a love for nature. And I think, Alison, it comes to just down to the point of love and compassion for all creation. And especially, I mean, we're the younger generations, we're going to live in the world way past, um, well, anyone who's made a lot of the damage. And it's our kids and their kids after them who are going to have to live with it. So it's feeling this love towards them and that we want to make a change for the world. And I think it can be overwhelming. I mean, we've heard from so many people today that have talked about all the things that we should be doing, recycling, fast fashion. And yes, all of this counts, but it can be overwhelming to a point. And I think where it changes from being overwhelming is by changing this mindset. Because if you have this love, it no longer feels like a call to action, but something you truly want to do. It comes from the heart and there's no other way to describe it, but it just comes spontaneously out of response of love and compassion to all people. And then it doesn't feel like sacrifice anymore. It doesn't feel like you're giving up something. It gives, feels like you're giving back something to God and to all creation. And I think it's summed up pretty well in Pope Francis's comment that the external deserts in the world are growing because the internal deserts in our hearts have become so vast. And I think this really embodies the interior conversion that humanity has to go through if we're going to make impactful change that is not just a trend, but just really sustains. Um, yeah, so I think that's where we're coming from. Yeah, and building from that mindset idea, it's, Ashani and I talked in long discussions about the idea of stewardship and how stewardship comes from older generations, even older generations in a school such as Ashani and I, setting the example uh, for younger generations um, because it is a problem as Pope Francis clearly indicates throughout um, the encyclical that the problem is our own. It is our fault. Um, it is through our wrongdoing that our ecological crisis has emerged. And so the solution in turn then lies with us. So as I said, setting the example as younger um, or two younger generations um, and the impact that older students have on younger uh, generations is unparalleled. Um, in creating not just a trend of love for the earth and love for the environment, but a permanent change. Um, and through that uh, setting the example, culture can then change. Um, cultures within schools, cultures within the greater community. Um, and that does take time. Yeah, we're not, we're not gonna kid ourselves and say this is gonna be an overnight solution, but once these examples are set in place, um, yeah, change can, can happen. Yeah, and I think a lot of this change comes from strong leadership and role models who recognise that things have to change. And yes, in times of change, I mean, we're seeing it now in COVID, that things are uncomfortable for a bit. But by changing the focus on the essence of life, not as individual components, but as a thriving interdependent community where humans take a renewed understanding of stewardship, which is not about entitlement, I should have this, I deserve this because I worked hard for this, to a place of service to our planet and to all future generations. And I think often we can get overwhelmed again by, oh my gosh, there's so much wrong. But I think we also need to look, which gives us more hope, is to look towards the good in the world and the change we're seeing from especially the younger generations, the people on the board today. I mean, Will and I have to look only to the people around our school who are willing to give up something for the greater good of the world. They're willing to take public transport. They're willing to not use straws. They're willing to go to vintage stores and use recycled fashion if it means that they can do something for the future generations. And I think this is where a lot of it comes from, is recognising how far we have to go, but also recognising how far we've come. And in, in recognising how far we have to go, I think the really important thing which Mia and Abigail have talked about is listening and responding to all people of the world, especially the poor and the disenfranchised. I mean, these are the voices that are not often heard, but they're the voices that are actually feeling drastic impacts of climate change already. I mean, we see it with our sister school in Kiribati. Who are, ha who are just struggling so much, not only are they feeling the effects of climate change, but the effects 
of economic overconsumption um, in their disenfranchisement. So I think we need to become part of, it needs to be a united front of solutions. Um, and for specifically for us, it's looking towards Indigenous people, who I think it really can't be overlooked, how we, we often talk about listening to them, but it's truly about listening, responding, and in certain places, giving up your spot so that they can speak because they have knowledge that is invaluable, that needs to be brought to the discussion. And it's about allowing, making room for them to come into it, which they haven't often been granted before. Yeah, and as Ashani was saying, it was interesting hearing all the acknowledgement of countries today, but it's been quite obvious listening to the bushfires and a lot of the climate issues that are most recent, that we haven't been acknowledging them, um, despite, you know, the the vocality of yes we are yes we are listening to them but if we can empower their voice it's 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 solutions that have been around for thousands of years as as um, people have touched on today um and also touching on that idea of um, our sister school in Kiribati, it almost becomes a social justice issue to an extent of how can we leave these people behind and if we truly are in trying to live in harmony with god's love on earth um, and God's love of nature, how, how can we ignore our sister schools and how can we ignore these people that are going through this crisis? Um, and I love this quote uh, from Pope Francis. Uh, Regrettably, many efforts to seek concrete solutions to the environmental crisis have proved ineffective, not only because of powerful opposition, but also because of a more general lack of interest. Um, and we believe that it's a lack of interest due to a lack of knowledge. As I said um, previously, it's an education that needs to be brought to the forefront, that younger generations and even older generations need to know what the problem is and how to solve it. Um, and so, yeah, I think that was... Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's it. <laughs> and if we can ask everyone one thing, it's just to change that mindset, to feel love for nature, for everyone else. And that's truly where our first step begins. So thank you. That's a great summary. And thank you so much for doing that together. That, that um, Father Claude, would you like to um, comment on, on um, Ashanti and, and Will's um, viewpoint on these issues? I'm not sure where I would start because they covered so many different points in so many different areas. But I really am overwhelmed, blown away by, by, what, what, by their understanding of uh, of the the whole question of uh, you know uh, the, the the earth and uh, how we respond to it and how we live with it, one of the things that really came came, came out strongly and I, I was really taken with that quote that um, uh, Shanti uh, took from Pope Francis, where she talked about the, you know about the external deserts and the internal deserts. You know that, that these are that what's happening outside of us is often happening because of what's what's happening within us. And uh, I did talk, uh, you know, in my little presentation about the, the, the moral disconnection, you know, and uh, there's, there's something that's been severed, uh, you know, in, in terms of our connectedness with earth and with, with, other, with other people. Um, I, I just, um, I'm not sure that all the, all the, um, the, uh, the problems are the fact that people are, are um, you know, are, are bad or anything like that, or, ill-willed, but there is a lot of ignorance. And, you know, partly part of what we're on about is, I think, just to try to make people aware and uh, aware of, of, the, of the issues. But coming back to the, the mindsets and so on, I think it's so important. It's just, to, you know, start with looking around you, you know, and, you know, as we, and uh, I think it was Jim Bailey is mentioning, you know, the, the provincial talk, walking around Monobay, look around you and notice what's happening what you know notice the beauty notice the um you know the whatever animal life is there the 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 uh the earth and also just the and the, you know the the waters and the sun and everything else all these things have something to they can change our hearts and you know and i just want to think that i think that um uh you know uh that, that you know even the whole the, the covid um the experience of covid might have actually opened our minds and hearts to the fact that there is something in us that where we feel a connectedness and the challenge is not to be disconnected, to feel connected with, with um, the people who are the poor, the people who are suffering because of 
you know, the economic uh, downturns and so on, people who are unemployed, um, people who have been living on the streets and, and somewhat invisible and forgotten. So these are all things that, you know, that, that are really, you know, that, that really struck me from the, from the presentation. The, the one other thing is, um, and I could go on and on because, uh, but, you know, the, when we talk about stewardship, we're talking about care. And I think they brought that out quite care, you know, clearly, quite, you know, quite well. I was just reading an article just a couple of days ago where a, a minister who was talking about people getting married, for example, and they, 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 they took their, they're writing their own vows and they, and they didn't write the word, I take you, but I receive you. I receive you. A, a, a different way of being present in our world towards other people and towards nature, not to something that we take, but something that we receive as a gift. And, uh, and we've received that gift from the First Nations people, this land. We haven't always listened and very often we haven't listened as we, as was, as Will put out, pointed out, with regard to the bushfires and so on, but uh, the challenge for us is to have that, you know, that heart that is caring, that heart that looks with love and awe, in order to respond with, uh, you know, very practical in very practical ways. Okay. Thank you, Claude. There's um there's an interesting comment come in um, from Andre Clausens. Um, you won't know who he is, most of you, but I'll tell you. Father Andre Clausens is um, one of the general counsellors, well, in other words, one of the world leaders of the MSC, um, the MSC order, and his responsibility is for um, for social justice and environmental issues. And he's he's pointed out, he's made a comment about how important education is as the antidote to the individualistic culture at this time. And then he goes on to say, and he's writing this from Rome, listening to those young people of your schools, I realize that you are doing very good out, very good work out there in this global education pact. Please go ahead working together for a new future. So young people, I'd encourage you to take that, um, that affirmation on board and perhaps go back to your teachers and your, your um, mission directors and your principals and your leadership teams and thank them for all the, the, all the work that they've done to help you because um, the people in Rome are thinking that you're pretty good. Uh, so we, um, we're a bigger family than just schools um, and Within the MSC family, there are many parishes. And we're going to hear from Melanie now, who um, is a member of the Finden Hindmarsh Catholic Parish in South Australia. And Melanie, I wonder, um, do you have a, a message for the Australian Catholic Church? Yes. Hello. Um, she does. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> Um, first of all, I'd just like to acknowledge um, the land from which I speak, uh, the Kaurna people, um, and we pay respects to the elders um, past, present and future. Um, so I'd also like to thank uh, everyone for speaking and I'm just getting so excited hearing from all the young people um, and the fact just knowing that we share the same passions and the same gusto for the environment and it's just it's really important to me and I'm just feeling really grateful right now um so um just to be specific the question that I am answering today is um from a young person's perspective what responsibility do parish communities have to embed ecological conversion into their parish life um and I love this question um, so we'll turn to Laudato Si. Um, Pope Francis uses teachings of St. Francis um, to try and emphasise that God's creations, the earth and its population, are the closest thing we have to a physical depiction of God. For what can tell us more about an artist than their art? Now more than ever, I think it's important for us all, young people and old, to see that we must see God in everything and everything is sacred. 
One particular quote that I think really embodies this is um, mentioned by St. Francis. Um, it's one of the closing statements made at a Heiki summit. Um, and I'll just say this. It is our humble conviction that the divine and human meet in the slightest detail, in the seamless garment of God's creation, in the last speck of dust of our planet. Um, and what a beautiful sentence. It really highlights one of the reasons that I'm a Catholic, I think, is that the belief that every single thing is important and loved by God and handcrafted by God. Uh, and I think many Catholic youth would agree with me. This theology, this theology, I believe, needs to be talked about much more in parishes. Um, but in terms of logistics and practicality, Working against climate change is much more than theologies and values, but rather, of course, action. Pope Francis also quotes in Laudato Si, um, he talks about a conversation that needs to include everyone. Um, and I think a lot of people would agree, of course, this problem is beyond a Catholic problem. Um, but what does a conversation that includes everyone looks like? For me, it is a push for inclusivity within parishes. It looks like the allyship between older demo, the older demographics and the youth. It looks like a safe space for youth to talk about the matters that are most important to them, whether or not they are accepted by the, the wider Catholic community. What I'm trying to say is that the urgency of climate change goes beyond the barriers of what the church may consider an ideal parishioner especially considering that a lot of the mainstream youth culture uh, is stigmatized these days. It's a bit hard to exist as a youth within the Catholic church. Um, and I think because of the importance of tradition within the Catholic church, um, a lot of the older demographics um, tend to look down upon the youth because of these cultural differences. Um, it must be advocated that to care for our common home is to fundamentally care for fellow humans, no matter their religion, race, sexuality or gender identity. Just as Pope Francis says, we are faced with not with two separate crises, crises, one environmental and the other social, but rather one complex crisis, which is both social and environmental. Parish communities have the responsibility to empower young people who face the consequences of a lack of action against climate change, to magnify their voices and support them in their endeavours to spread awareness instead of breaking them down and dismissing them as dramatic. This needs to go further than performative speeches from youths when it suits the congregation, but rather genuine dialogue within the church with deep and intensive listening to the collective voices of the youth, um, which is why I'm so happy to be here because that is definitely what I see happening. Um, but as a young person within my church, I often feel as though I am outnumbered. Um, and it can be intimidating to speak out for what we really care about, especially when we are the ones who will be facing the consequences of climate change. Um, these com conversations can be controversial, but what does controversial matter when our brothers and sisters of in the Polynesian country of Tuvalu, as Abigail mentioned, are threatened by rising sea levels, which are said to render their home uninhabitable within 50 years? What does controversy matter when by 2050, oceans will contain more plastic than fish? Parish education begins with habits, both religious and social. For example, this may include homilies on climate and compassion. Um, this may include prayers of intention with themes embodying the consequences of climate change. Outside of mass, it might look like sustainable community activities, i.e. without plastic or with food sourced from community gardens, and engaging all people, both young and old, in mindfulness exercises about consumption and gratitude for the gifts that God has blessed us with and their links to spirituality as a Catholic. So let's consider these changes. I really truly believe wholeheartedly that facilitating youth empowerment and inclusivity within parish communities are fundamental steps to be taken for the fight against environmental issues. 
Climate change does not take into consideration the age difference, race, gender, or sexuality of those it affects. So why should we when looking for a solution? Thank you, Melanie. Mark, can we yeah. ask you to respond? Oh, wow, there's some uh, challenges there, uh, aren't <laughs> there, for all of us. I tell you, I, I loved, um, I particularly loved your uh, comment, how better to know the artists than by their art. And I think um, that really touches, uh, that touched me greatly because I think we, you know, so many of us um, and so many people do, do not appreciate, you know, that, that awe and wonder and the majesty of creation and how important it is and how much of a reflection of God's love for us. You know, it's a beautiful thing. Your challenges to the, um, to the church, uh, you know, any parish would be lucky to have you, I must admit, um, <laughs> because some of the parishes I go into, you would, you would be the only person under about 70 there. Um, so if they, were, if they have you, they should be grabbing onto you and do that and, and listening to all that you say. All those inclus inclusivity. I, look, um, I, I don't want to be defensive here about the, the old people, and I was just thinking I'm an old person now, so I suppose I can... Uh, I can speak on behalf of them, but um, I, I, I hope um, uh, I hope you get, do get the opportunity to speak with them. I think that many of them, uh, more perhaps, hopefully more than you think, uh, would be open to all of those things that you speak of, um, because I just don't, um, you know, those who who do have uh, you know faith and, and those who do attend church these days have to be hopeful people. Mm, and if they're not, you have to be hopeful to be there and I think um, if they're hopeful they will be hopeful about all those aspects of God's creation and will be open to much of what you say so and, and I'm hope, hopefully that will be the case with your um, uh, other leaders of your parish as well as the seniors okay. yeah awesome point thank you, thank you Mark uh, we have one more uh, formal contribution uh, and uh, this comes from um, Aidan Johnson. And Aidan, Aidan, in a sense, have, has a foot in many camps. He's the head of science in a Catholic secondary school. He um, has a PhD in matters pertaining to the environment and the earth. Um, he is an active member of his parish and he is the, um, um, the founder of the Heartworks community within the MSC family. And I think what Aidan has to say creates a wonderful summary. He's speaking from a parish perspective, but I think it could equally be addressed to um, each of your schools where it's very likely that today the cleaners had to go around after lunch and pick up all manner of things that were not dropped by the old people and um, were not put in the recycling bins. So let's listen to Aidan as as the final word from the young people and, um, and take his challenge on board wherever we are. Um, and I'd encourage all of those of you who are listening as well to take Aidan's challenge into wherever, wherever it is that you have responsibility. Good evening, everyone. Uh, sorry, I couldn't be there live in person. Um, but I just wanted to share a few of my thoughts on the matter of, I suppose, environment as a ministry. And I think my main message is really that it can't be its own ministry. You can't do ministry of environment because it needs to be in everything we do. Um, for example, when I went to World Youth Day, you know, a great ministry of trying to promote Catholic faith within the youth of today but while I was there I saw a whole heap of food wastage rubbish everywhere wastage plastics um, the list goes on and that to me was a real struggle while I was on the World Youth Day kind of wrestling with well this great ministry and yet so much destruction to the environment and so I suppose that's my message that when we do ministry, we need to think about the environment in everything we do. Um, so looking at parishes, you know, having a welcome barbecue, such a great thing to do. But do we stop to think about the plastic plates, the cutlery, okay? Yes, we might need to spend a couple of hours washing up afterwards if we use reusable um, utensils, but 
that's much smaller than the impact of the disposable equipment otherwise. As a science teacher, I think education is so important. And this is a big drive for why I do what I do. Uh, the more we can educate the next generation about the, the impacts that they have on the world, the quicker we can make a change. But it doesn't stop there. We need to educate ourselves. We need to be aware of our impact. And often people don't mean to be destructive to the environment. They're just not aware. Documentaries like Craig's Rue Castle's War on Waste and his more recent A Fight for Planet A are a great start. They promote an understanding of the impact that we have in our everyday actions. David Attenborough's most lit recent release shows the impact that we're having and that if we don't change what's going to happen to our world. These are all readily accessible and easily digestible things that we can access. Often we hear said that we're just a small contributor compared to other countries. What impact can we make? Well, I can tell you now that Kiribati, one of the smallest nations in the world, are making a difference. They are doing everything in their power to reduce their tiny carbon footprint. They have gone solar. They are reducing their car usage. They are looking at their pollution problem. They are doing what they can. Why? Because this affects them directly. They know if that dough don't change their habits, then they won't have a home to go to in the near future. We have a responsibility to these nations to look after them. The missionary of the Sacred Heart speak about being on earth, the heart of God. This is how we do it, by loving our neighbours in our other countries, by providing them a world in which they can live. The first mission given to Adam was to look after the earth. We have a deep calling and we need to follow through with it. Now, I know as an individual this can be scary. We think we're not in politics. What can we do? Start small. I remember when I sort of started on my venture of trying to better my environmental impact, I started with soft plastics, a very little thing, collect up your soft plastics, take them back to Woolies or Coles and put them in the soft plastic bin to be recycled. Now, there's a lot of scepticism as to whether this actually gets recycled or not, but by doing this simple step, what it did for me is made me realise how much soft plastic I was consuming. And the next step was to change my behaviour. So suddenly I started to look at what I was buying and reducing the amount of soft plastic because I was amazed by how much I was collecting. When I can, I choose glass or aluminium cans. I try to avoid things such as plastics, which I know have a bigger impact on the world. So hopefully you can see that environmental mission is more than just a mission. It needs to be a part of everything we do. I'm not asking you to change everything all at once. Just choose one thing and do one thing well, whether it be in your own home, in your parish, school, or wherever it is that you are. If we can all make one incremental change, this is the way that we can change the way the world is going. This is the way that we love God and God's creation and love our neighbour. Thank you. Thank you, Aidan. What a great summary. So we're coming to the end, but we're not quite there yet. And um, young people, I'd invite you to listen really closely. What I'm going to do now is to invite for one minute our, um, our introductory speakers to speak back to you and to tell you what they have heard you say and how, that, how they want to implement that um, what more, that added extra that you have challenged from them into their own lives. And so um, very important for you to hear, um, to, for you to know that you are being heard. So Jackie, can we begin with you? One minute. What did you hear and um, how is it going to change you? How can it change you? Thanks, Alison. I think uh, what I heard, if I said it in one word, across all of the amazing messages from the young people on this webinar, what I felt and heard was hope. And that is the most essential ingredient from a faith perspective, from an earth future perspective, and from an action perspective. So 
what I think this is calling me to do and a question that's been sitting with me and that's come up in this webinar is to invite you and ask you, given that I'm working um, at the Vatican and with the Ecology Task Force, um, we're planning, of course, this seven year plan initiative in response to COVID, but also in response to the five year anniversary of Laudato Si moment. It'll be launched in May next year. I'm wondering if the MSC schools in Australia would like to be part of the first group of schools who take up a commitment for seven year action plans, because it feels to me like you're ready. In terms of the messages, in terms of the support structures, in terms of the great things that are already happening and the fact that you're such early adopters, you could be an exemplar to the schools in Australia as a group of religious schools taking that on. And you could be a great example and champion uh, from Australia globally. So that's what I'd like to say in my minute. And I probably took a bit longer, so I'll stop there, Alison. But thanks, you've been amazing tonight. Thank you, Jackie. And um, there's a challenge there for you, Mark. Um, as Director of Education and Young People, there's actually a challenge in it for you to go back to your principals, to go back to your leadership teams, I'm sure all your principals are watching, but to go back to them and to see if you can actually pick up this and it's not just talking, but it becomes action. And Melanie, I'm sure we could connect you with the head of MSC Parishes. And likewise, for, um, for you, perhaps you can be involved in an ongoing way as well. In, in um, The seven-year plans are for parishes too, Melanie, so let's do it. There you go. There's a challenge for you. Um, you've all got my phone number and my contact if you need to be connected. Claude, can we go to you? Can you, in one minute, what did you hear and how has it changed you? Um, I heard something about things being overwhelming, and uh, and I um, and uh, but at the same time as as Jackie had had, uh, had uh, reflected on is about that in the, in spite of that, the hope is you know or I, as I always say that hope is you know is is something that walks, it's something that's done. And we've had so many examples of what's possible um, to make that hope come alive in our in our schools and in our parishes. It's uh, as I was, you know I said earlier, I was just over overwhelmed by the contribution of the young people. And not and and the thing is, we you know, and I just you know, um, I'm, the challenge for me is to listen more to what the young people have to say, not only the young, but also uh, people, the first peoples and so on. But in this instance, the young people, because they have, a, I'm not working in a parish, I'm not working in a school, so I don't have that access. But um, certainly I can promote, I can promote the justice and peace and integrity of creation issues. And uh, listening more to what the young people have said today has been so inspiring. And I just want to take that on. Thank you, Claude. Um, Krish, one minute from you. Gosh, um, look, I, I'm so inspired by, by, by every one of you as well. I heard the slogan, just do it. I think that's, that's, that for me sums it up for, for, for all your voices, just do it. If we have to acknowledge that we have a problem, we need to change, just do it. We need to learn from the first peoples of the land, just do it. If we need to gather everyone together in a collective voice to shout out to our leaders, just do it. If we need to uh, be more inclusive in the parishes, we need to uh, bring together um, experts in the field, just do it. And, and I just love that. I just love that energy. I just love that uh, sense of uh, taking ownership for now. If, um, especially, I think a couple of you talked about our brothers and sisters in Kiribati. How can we leave them behind? Let's do something for them. We can see that now. We might not always see what's in the future, but we can see what's happening now and just do it. I like that, I like that. And uh, certainly from a parish point of view, uh, I like to be listening to more of those voices and, uh, and um, yeah, bringing them together to, to help, uh, I guess, change our culture and uh, 
yeah, and, and be and be be more caring for our common home. So thank you, thank you all. Thank you, Christian. Mark, lastly to you, one minute. What did you hear and how has it changed you? We got Mark? No, just oh, sorry, I just had to unmute myself. I've, I've been listening to, to keenly. Um, yes, uh, what did I hear? Uh, there's obviously great passion um, around this. I heard some very articulate and very thoughtful young people, which was lovely, um, which is a characteristic of our schools, which is a really special thing. And, um, and I heard people with passion. I heard people uh, that are hope-filled exactly. My, my, uh, my, the lesson for me is not to become uh, disillusioned as an old person, you do sometimes. And um, my, you know, what can, what can we do about it? Uh, we can do what I said we're going to do. We're going to try and uh, implement across our schools uh, this whole, um, uh, uh, as part of their ethos and, and uh, mission review, that, the, you know, what are they doing uh, with respect to um, uh, sustainability and with respect to the education that they're giving our students to make sure that, um, you know, the best re uh, results are coming. And I'll certainly be making contact with Jackie to, um, uh, to see how we can advance that. Wonderful. And um, there are messages coming in from all over the world, um, from the teachers in your schools and from people, um, from people all over the world, commending you young people and um, wanting to know what's happening in Australia that that such fine young people that we have such fine young people. Uh, from me, I would, um, I would encourage you to continue the conversation with each other. Um, keep there's a beautiful energy that's flowing and it we can keep it flowing I think when we when we keep connected and it can be the antidote to the hopelessness and to the negativity and um and to the the commentary out there that becomes so disillusioning um, it can help us work our way through the unreliability of information that um, we are surrounded by. So stay in touch, stay with each other, um, stay passionate, stay commitment, stay committed. If there's anything that any of we old people can do to help you, then please ask because we're all we're all walking with you. We. Um, we're going to bring our webinar to a conclusion. I'd like to um, I'd like to thank the panelists very much. They worked very hard to um, to um, present those very short and very pointed um, commentaries on Laudato C. Si. I'd particularly like to thank the young people. You're amazing. Everybody's saying that to you, and they're not just words. I'd like to thank your teachers and the people in your parishes who've worked with you and helped you um, help you be, helped you um, find your way into Laudato Si. Uh, I'd like to thank those people behind the scenes here in the institute who've created, who've allowed this this webinar to happen. And as we finish, we're going to finish with a reflection from the fourth MSC College, Monovay College in Victoria. And please don't click off, it's only three minutes. Monovay College has been under lockdown for months and months and months. They have been, um, been um, schooled from home. And what we're going to conclude with is a reflection that was created by their um, faith and mission, their head of faith and mission, Danny Frank, uh, sent out to all of their students in the middle of lockdown to celebrate the season of creation. And it, it's a collage of pictures and images of the beauty of creation from um, the homes of the students um, who were locked down. So thank you everyone for participating and let's, um, let's be further inspired by, um, by this montage of photos and images. Thank you everyone. Welcome to this celebration as we celebrate the season of creation. The season of creation begins on the 1st of September and continues until the feast of St Francis of Assisi, the patron saint of ecology on the 4th of October. This is a time where many Christians embrace the important role each of us has to play as stewards who called to care for our common home. Today's liturgy will highlight creation itself and all the photographs have been taken by our students, staff and family. Enjoy.
Stars exploding in the wake of your love Galaxies all turn their heads The skies are gazing on their one creator Universe in all You sit enthroned above the earth's great circle Mountains reach for you The ocean waves hum a lullaby Whole wide world in all Can't help but be still Marvel at you My eyes catch a glimpse In every sunset You trace dreams upon my mind My skin and bones can feel your touch I shiver heart and soul Our God is love. At the very dawn of creation, God saw that it was good, because all of creation was brought to life out of God's love. Then that love exists within all of creation. When we do good things, we are a reflection of God's love for our world. And may the Sacred Heart of Jesus be everywhere loved, forever. Our Lady of the Sacred Heart, pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen.